Remember, in the spring of 1862, uh, Lincoln and many in the North were pushing General McClellan to move again. There had been this long period of nothing happening in the war. Finally, and this is our map here of the East, McClellan embarks on what we call the Peninsular Campaign, marching down toward, well, heading toward Richmond. But instead of going overland, he decides to use the, the Union's naval superiority to ferry his army down into Chesapeake, you see from Washington, down the Potomac River into Chesapeake Bay, down to Norfolk where Fortress Monroe was, and then up and attack Richmond from the south and the east. When you land here, you're much closer to Richmond than if you'd come over land. And he, it's a gigantic logistical operation. He moves this gigantic army of well over 100,000 men and starts marching up the peninsula toward Richmond. Um, but McClellan had this terrible problem of being cautious, being slow, and he tremendously outnumbered the Confederate forces facing him, and yet he didn't just march along. He sort of besieged little towns and gave, waited, and it took a time to, to, to seize them, and it led uh, the Confederates uh, to, uh, gave them time to consolidate uh, their forces. Um, but finally, the, say, the famous Seven Days campaign took place here between uh, the armies of McClellan and Robert E. Lee, who at the, in the middle of this takes over as the commander of the Confederate Army in Virginia. Um, and uh, the, the so-called Battle of the Seven Days. But McClellan always felt he didn't have enough troops. He greatly exaggerated the number of troops facing him. He, at one point, he said Lee had 200,000 men, which was triple the size of Lee's actual army. Um, and the, in the end, the campaign was just a deadlock. McClellan got within about five miles of Richmond. Some members of his, some parts of his army could actually see the church steeples of Richmond in the distance, the capital of the Confederacy. But he was never able to get any further than that. Lee was able to block his way. There were several very bloody battles. But eventually, McClellan decides to retreat. And he brings his whole army back down to what's called Harrison's Landing, down the peninsula near Norfolk. McClellan was, a, was shaken, and maybe he just wasn't, he was too nice a guy to be a general. He was shaken by the sight of death. He, he loved his troops. He didn't want to see any of them killed and wounded. Uh, he kept complaining the government had not sustained the army, not given him enough support, not given him enough reinforcements. He blamed everybody else for his uh, mistakes or losses. He sent a message to... Um, to Stanton, the, um, after the Battle of the Seven Days, he sent a message to Secretary of War Stanton saying, I have seen too many dead and wounded to feel otherwise than that the government has not sustained this army. The government has not sustained the army. Why? Because Lincoln insisted that McClellan leave a significant number of men, about 15 to 20,000, to protect Washington, D.C. Because you see, the problem is, McClellan's army is down here. What's to prevent the Confederates from sending troops to seize Washington while McClellan's miles and miles away? Lincoln insisted, your plan is all right, although he didn't actually think much of it, but all right, you can do what you want. I'm not a general, but you've got to leave enough troops to defend Washington. Lincoln understood that if the Confederates overran Washington, it would be a tremendous blow to northern morale. In other words, he's thinking politically. It wouldn't end the war. But um, it would be a tremendous blow to morale. It would also might in, in, induce European recognition of the Confederacy. McClellan didn't think those ways. He was not political in that way, and he didn't understand the importance of defending Washington. So anyway, he thought that the government had not sustained the army in that way. If I save the army, he wrote, I tell you plainly, I owe no thanks to you, the Secretary of War, or any other person in Washington. You have done your best to sacrifice the army. In other words, McClellan was, a, 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 he had this persecution complex, basically, and he thought everyone in Washington was conspiring against him. He believed the radical Republicans were conspiring against him. Um, as I say, he was, you know, he didn't like to fight. He was a general who didn't like to fight. I mean, personally, I think it's good that people don't like to fight. But uh, maybe not if you're a general at the head of an army in a war, you know. 
Um, as I said last time, he thought he would outmaneuver. He would put such a force on the ground that the Confederates would realize they would have to negotiate an end to the war. And that would be great. You'd end the war without bloodshed, but it wasn't happening, obviously. So by July 1862, McClellan is entrenched at Harrison's Landing. The Coniscilla campaign is over. Uh, Lincoln visits him at his army camp to find out what he's doing, and McClellan hands Lincoln a letter uh, saying, the war must be waged in accord with what he calls high Christian principles. What does that mean? There must be no uh, uh, attack or no harm come to civilians. It should be a war of army against army, nor should any property be confiscated, nor should slavery be affected by the war. This is McClellan's idea of how the war ought to be fought. Lincoln understood you could never win the war in that manner. It was impossible to win the war the way McClellan thought it should be conducted. So finally, McClellan was ordered back to Washington, and this several months uh, was a failure. Um, McClellan's problem was not that he was a coward, not that he was soft-hearted, but as I say, he wasn't anti-slavery. He didn't see the relationship of slavery to the war. He didn't see the politics of the war. He thought, as I said, generals could kind of negotiate an end to the war among themselves. So that's the situation in the East. Meanwhile, in the West, Union momentum has um, also stalled in the middle of 1860, um, in the middle of 1862. In April, in a significant victory, the Union Navy, it's a naval superiority or something they definitely had, the Union Navy had sailed in and captured New Orleans, the most important city in the Confederacy, really, the largest city in the Confederacy. As we all know, ever since Hurricane Katrina, or if you've ever visited New Orleans, it's right near the mouth of the Mississippi River at the Gulf of Mexico, and Union gunboats with uh, Admiral uh, David Farragut, his fleet, sailed up and conquered New Orleans. There were a couple of Confederate forts. This is a nice, colorful picture of the Battle of New Orleans. This is a major victory for the Union to seize the largest city in the Confederacy, and a city with significant pro-Union sentiment. A city with a lot of immigrants, unlike most of the South. A city with many merchants who want to restore, a great mercantile center, want to restore relations with the North and with, as we will see, a very significant free black population. Thanks to the French heritage, there was a significant free black population, propertied, educated, uh, and with certain rights, which um, um, blacks in other parts of the uh, country didn't have, like the right to have their own militia unit. When the United States purchased Louisiana, one of the arrangements with Napoleon was that the free blacks in New Orleans or Louisiana would keep the rights that they had under French rule. So there was, there's a base there for pro-Union sentiment in New Orleans to build a pro-Union government, uh, other, unlike in some other parts, many other parts of the South. After that, though, the next major thing, or actually right at the same time, was up here in Shiloh. Remember, Grant had um, taken those two forts uh, uh, in Tennessee, and now he moves down, and at Shiloh, the first really horrible battle of the Civil War takes place with immense casualties. The first battle with thousands of casualties, almost 2,000 dead, several thousand wounded on either side. Shiloh comes out of nowhere. Grant happens to be entrenched or, or encamped somewhere. The Confederates have a surprise attack on him. He manages to hold it off in two days, but there are like 2,000 dead on each side, 10,000 wounded and missing, a, a tremendous bloodshed at Shiloh. Um, and this is really the first indication of what this war is going to become in terms of massive death. But, it, but again, it, Grant is unable to move forward from there, so the momentum is stalled in the West also. And all of the, you might say, the failure to win the war in the traditional way opens the door to emancipation, which is, a, among other things, a plan to win the war in a different way. 